biggest challenge in data analytics is that projects are failing. Gartner estimates that 50 to 80% of all data analytics projects fail. Despite having great new people who are data scientists, great new tools and databases, $150 billion in spent every year in tech, it fundamentally comes down to a people and process problem. And that's what data ops tries to address. It focuses purely on helping people in their process with their tools, with all their data, be successful and deliver unparalleled insight to their customers. Hello everyone, I would like to welcome both our in-person audience and virtual audience to Track 4, Translating Data into Actionable Insights. I'm Lakshmi Vandal from Informatica. I'm a track producer and moderator for this session. So the session this hour is how to realize value from data democratization. So the panel discussion will focus on challenges and opportunities of data democratization. Why and how culture, process, and technology plays a critical role in enabling data democratization. Before I introduce the panel moderator, a few housekeeping details. This session is being recorded and it will be available to you as part of your registration. Uh, virtual audience, please submit your questions via Whoa app Q&A tab. And in-person audience, please raise your hand and I will bring the microphone to you. So our panel moderator is Raj Nimagada from Sanofi. She is a global head of R&D office where she drives data strategies and data governance program. You can introduce the panelist. Yeah. Thank you, Lakshmi. Thank you, everyone, for joining in the room and in the, uh, online. Uh, I think data democratization is not uh, new for anyone, uh, irrespective of industry or any company. So uh, it's a very important topic. Um, I, I'm Raj Nimagadda, heading up the R&D data office at Sanofi. Uh, past 20 years in my life is in pharma, uh, leading data and, data, uh, data and digital transformations. So um, irrespective of the size of the company, uh, the data is, a, 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 data is a, a big asset and a problem. So trying to solve the data democratization at different scales. So um, would like to share my experiences um, through the panel uh, in, in, in the next one hour. So here today, we are joining with uh, Luca Quata from BCG and Shawing Vue uh, from um, Jensen R&D. And Raman couldn't make it, Raman Daran from Takeda, he couldn't make it, but he's online. Uh, he'll be listening to us and maybe posting some questions. So um, over to you, Luca. Maybe. Can you introduce yourself? Yeah, thank you very much. So as said by Raj, I'm partner associate and director at uh, BCG. Um, I'm in the expert track of BCG, meaning that I'm working only on data and analytics uh, topics. Uh, I'm leading data governance and what we call uh, data at scale at BCG. So everything you have to manage to be able to use your data and to uh, generate your insight at scale in the, in, the, in the company. Before being in the consulting, I was uh, like you in the real life. Uh, I was chief data analytics officer in a European big banking group. Uh, and before that, I was a researcher in mathematics. Um, hey, everyone. Yeah, uh, thank you. Um, my name is Xiaoyin Wu. I'm part of the uh, Jensen R&D Data Science team. Um, I'm leading the data platform and privacy organization within the data science organization. And my team is actually more focusing on data, data, data engineering, data solution, data science solution, data governance, and privacy, AI, and ethic. A lot of things under my, uh, my team. And uh, my background is a physician by training with computer science and biostatistics. Um, I've been with Jane Jensen for over 14 years, and before that I was in the uh, medical imaging space uh, doing medical imaging analysis at Penn Medical School. Um, very happy to be here. Thank you for the invitation. and looking forward to the panel discussion. Okay, so thank you. So my role now will be to warm you up <laughs> and to share with you some studies and some insight um, we, we have at, um, at BCG, and then we will use that to, to engage the discussion with some questions that will be moderated by, by Raj. So, uh, since 10 years at uh, BCG, we are serving the, the market and uh, what we call the maturity of the companies in uh, managing their data and, and AI uh, transformation. Um, we do that using that framework. Uh, this represents the seven 
main capabilities we, we think that you have to manage in order to deal with your data and AI uh, tra tra transformation. So let me quickly explain it. We think that everything starts from the top. Everything starts from your vision. So a clear expression coming from the top management of the company of why data and AI or data science or advanced analytics is important uh, for you. Is it to create a, a new piece of business? Is it to create a new customer experience? Is it to create additional top line or to reduce the bottom line or things like that? So it has to be very clear what you want to do and what is your ambition with that. Because as soon as this is clear, you can translate this vision into use cases. What are the use cases? The use cases are the projects. These are the levers you will use in order to uh, materialize the, um, the, the vision. These use cases, you have to be clear about them and you have to prioritize them. You have to priori prioritize them according to the impact you, you believe uh, they, will, they will generate, but most of all, according to the feasibility. And the feasibility is represented by all the other layers. So as soon as you have your vision, you, you, you have the, the, um, the, um, the, the use cases, you start to understand what is the insight you have to generate. Then you know the insight you have to generate, you, you, you start to think about how to generate them. So how to organize what are your, the skills you need from BI to advanced analytics, uh, machine learning, deep learning, how to organize them, how to attract the talents, how to upskill the people to make sure that you have a good time to market working with the business and with the IT to generate that insight. Knowing now how you will generate the insight, you have to think about what is the raw material you need in order to generate this insight. These are the data, right? And how to manage, how to manage the data, so everything that we call classically data governance, so how to bring the right data to the right people at the right point in time with the right quality, privacy, and security. So all the processes, all the rules, all the um, roles and responsibilities to ensure that. So now you have the data, you know how you will generate the insight. The big piece is technology. What's your data architecture? What are your data and digital platforms in order to get the data, source the data, transform the data, make this data available to the front line? And then everything relies on some ecosystems to accelerate all of this. Three types of ecosystems, the data ecosystem itself, so where you can retrieve the third party data that you don't have internally, or potentially being the orchestrator of that ecosystem if, if you want to monetize your, your data. And then two other types of ecosystems, ecosystems of vendors, ecosystems of technical vendors, and ecosystems of more scientific uh, vendors. First, is very important because it, it accelerates your transformation. You don't have usually all the skills that, uh, that you need, so you can accelerate. But you have to be very thoughtful about that because you don't want to be stuck with your vendors. You want to be able to use them to upskill you, to use them when you need them, but also to be, um, uh, to be able to do what you want to do by yourself because it's part of your competitive advantage. On the, on the other hand, it's very important to be part of an ecosystem uh, a technical and scientific ecosystem because the best way to keep your people is to have your people connected with the external world. They have to be proud of what they are doing internally inside to share it and to learn what is done outside to bring the best of what they, they, they see outside internally. If, if you are not part of this kind of ecosystem, the risk that you are losing your best talents is very, is very big. And then on the left hand side, you have a narrow change management, uh, data and analytics, AI transformations like every transformation, you have to, to manage it, you have to manage the change uh, in the ways of working, the ways of deciding. Uh, basically, if you generate new insight and you keep exactly the same processes than before, there is no reason why the people will, will use this new insight. You know, they will just continue to work and to decide like before. So you have to change something so that they will use this new insight at a new point in time to generate new decisions. So this is the, the, the framework we, uh, we use, and we analyze the market, so we analyze the, um, the companies across the world, across, the, um, across different industries and sectors to understand where they are on these, um, on these capabilities. And basically, every two to three years, we ask questions, um, and the questions are, where are you in a scale from one to five? For each question, this maturity scale is described, each, uh, you know, what, mean, what uh, one means for that question, one of five means for, for that, these questions. And the three is our understanding a priori of where the market is on average. Then we receive the result and we check if we are 
right, if we have well understood the market and we are able then to position the different players, different sectors, different geographies and things like that. And when we work with our clients, we are able to share with them where their competitors are and things like that, what are the, the main gaps they, 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 they want to, to close. So because of my friends today with, uh, with me are from mainly healthcare, I've uh, decided to use the healthcare data um, to, to share with you some, some insight. So on the, on the left hand side, you see the different industries ranked from the top one to the, to, the, to, the, to, the, to the last one. Healthcare is actually a good example because they are almost on the average of the, uh, of the, different, uh, uh, of the different industries. Um, in 2018, they were at a maturity uh, level of 268. So it means that 300, as I told you, it's the average of the market. We call that mainstream, right? So they were a bit below mainstream, and now they moved a bit, and they are almost a bit, a bit above uh, mainstream globally. And then you have the big techs, uh, mainly the big techs, more than the telcos at the top, FIs, and, 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 and so on. What is perhaps more uh, interesting when you look at uh, the healthcare, the healthcare data on the on the right hand side, is that they progressively moved moved back, moved up since 2015. You know, a first step, more than six person starting to understand what it takes to uh, to progress in that uh, in that area, uh, then moving as I told you, a, a good 15 person between 2008 and 2021, and. Uh, for the next period, because when we ask the question, we ask where you are today and what is your ambition for the next two to three years. And the ambition is to continue to mature the data capabilities by almost 30%. And you will see, so it's, it's, a, it's a signal that for that industry, like for all the other industries, this data analytics topic remains an important point on the, uh, on the agenda. But I can tell you that they will not achieve that. I will show you that uh, right, right after. So basically, if you look at the, at the market, on average, more or less, you have more or less 35% of the players that are at the fairly advanced stage of maturity. Advanced stage of maturity, it's, um, it's an index of more than 350, uh, uh, 350 uh, points in our, in, our, in our scale. So as you can see, you have a bit more on the, on the telco, exactly 35% in healthcare, a bit less in the industrial goods and, and automotive, uh, automotive topic. So basically, if you look, people that are lagging behind, people that are developing, people that are advanced, so basically uh, less than 150, uh, less than uh, 250, 250, 350, more than 350. Um, this is the ambition in, in blank, the ambition they have for the next three years. So basically, people are saying that they want to catch up with, uh, with the best in class, uh, while the best in class will continue to grow up, of course. Uh, the advanced uh, players say that they will grow by 15%, their, their data capabilities. They will achieve that. 15% is the average of the growth of the data capabilities since five, six, seven years. So they will achieve that. They have understood how to do it. They will, they will do it. So, 30%, respectively 60%, 62% for the, for the laggards is completely unachievable. So it means that during the next period, the gap between the top players in data and, and advanced analytics and the others will continue, will continue to widen. So this is a real call for action for all these people. There is a way to accelerate, uh, but they have to change the way they, 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 they do it. And actually, data dem democratization is a key topic there. I will explain it uh, after. Now, if you look at in healthcare especially, how, uh, how, how it will evolve, or how they predict uh, they want to, to evolve between 2021 and 2024, basically, with a share of 14% today in the advanced, advanced player, Actually, half of the population thinks that they will be there. While again, if you look at the, the agenda they have, the ambition they have in, in front of them, I mean, almost 90% for the laggards, developing, mainstream, 20, 22%. So even this one, it will be a challenge. Right? Again, here, they focus on 6%. It's completely achievable. Here, 
knowing that on average it's 15 percent, more or less half of them will 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 fail. So definitely, this is a hard this is a hard topic. Only one third of the market, one third of the ambition has been reached during the last uh, the last period, and the main four common pitfalls that I that I see. Uh, in realizing these ambitions are, are here. So very often it's a question of lacking ambition. Uh, you know, you have big uh, presentation from the board and things like that, but at the end of the day, uh, nothing really concrete uh, on, the, on the ground. It's also missing creativity of what you can do with your, with your data. And personally, I think that the first part of the democratization is a good understanding of what you can do with your data. Uh, then you can think about how to make them accessible and things like that. But what you can do and what you want to do with your data, uh, you, you, you need a good understanding and a good creativity to make the difference. Um, then, of course, everything related to the technology, accessibility of the data, the fact that the data are sil siloed in the company, very often it's a, big, uh, it's, a big, it's a big problem. Another big problem, and I'm sure in the room you all share that, it's the inability to manage the quality of the, of the data, lacking the understanding on why data governance is important to support all, the, all of these uh, ambitions. And last but not least, the question of culture. Again, data de 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 democratization is a big topic there. Question of culture. It's what does it take really to, what do you have to change in the company in the ways of working, the ways in this, uh, of deciding, and the ways of operating? As I've said, if you don't change the ways of working, people will just continue to work as before. They will not use the data, the insight that you make, uh, that you make available. So in order to do that, as it's, um, it's very difficult, you have to, to, to break down the complexity. And what we think makes, uh, so in, if you want to break down the complexity, you need a good strategy. What is a strategy? Actually, it's an articulation of the why, the what, and the how you do uh, with your data and, and, and analytics. So the first part is the why, right? the top of the pyramid. This is your vision and how you, con you, 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 you translate the, the vision. So it's what are the business outcomes you want out of your uh, data analytics uh, transformation. And then the what, and very often we skip the what. We speak about the data transformation, but we don't take care of the data. We take care of the data science, we, did, we, we, did, we, we take care of a lot of fancy things, but we don't speak about the data, right? So what are the data that are critical to generate these business outcomes? I'm used to say that you have to discover your, what I call, your advantage data set. What are your 20% of data set that are making 80% of the impact on these business outcomes? And then start to put in place your data technology, your data governance, your data culture in place on these 20% of data sets. If you demonstrate the impact of that, there is a huge value, and then you create a, a, a big traction uh, to, to, take care of the, to take care of the rest. Then as soon as you know what you want to do and what, what is the, the raw material you need to do, to do that, you start to put the how in, in, in place. So your data, what I call the data factory, your, your data governance and your data, your data platform, then all your analytics, and then the culture. And this is a good way to break down the complexity because if you prioritize your, your business outcome, if you prioritize the data sets, you recognize what are the key data sets you have to prioritize in your data factory, so data governance and data platform, then you have a clear way to create a roadmap to do all the rest. Let me stop here. And let me start by asking Raj and Shaolin if this it rings, uh, rings a bell or if it uh, works differently in their company. Um, first of all, thank you for a great, great presentation and a summary. And uh, um, as, as uh, Luca mentioned, the industry trend is actually pretty much aligned with uh, what we're seeing in the healthcare um, kind of a space. And uh, at Jensen, I think um, we're kind of a little bit ahead of game um, because thank you for our you know, business strategy, R&D strategy, data science strategy. Uh, this is actually very important because data science is a high on our agenda. And uh, because of that, uh, we're actually looking very closely how we can in using data science to bring the right medicine to the right patient at right time. And uh, with that, um, we identified a high priority projects, use cases as Lucas just mentioned, um, and start building the core capabilities 
to enable the data science and data ecosystem within the uh, Jensen R&D uh, community. And one of the key things there is you have to identify priority, 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 and making sure you start building the core capabilities in terms of technology enablement to bring the um, quality data to enable the high priority use cases. And that drives a lot of innovation and drives a lot of growth and drive a lot of, uh, you know, kind of a foundation capabilities and bring the business together and moving forward on the innovation. So this is super important and, uh, you know, I can share a bit more on that. Um, in Jensen R&D, we actually build uh, a Mad AI ecosystem, our one-stop shop for uh, Jensen R&D data science uh, analysis data platform. And that ecosystem, of course, has a lot of different components. Uh, you know, start with a catalog, start with a data hub, start, start with, you know, data science workbench. All these different things work together as a holistic ecosystem to enable our data scientists to do their projects at scale. And we also build a lot of uh, automation in terms of data pipelines, engineering pipelines, and that can be reused uh, from different, for different type of use cases and to bring all different diverse data into our data hub for integration purpose. And uh, this is actually kind of our core foundation and uh, funct foundational capabilities to enable data science at Jensen R&D. Um, Raj, I don't know if you want to share more. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Shereen. Um, it's completely resonant to what uh, we are experiencing in, at Sanofi. So we embarked on the digital transformation journey a couple of years ago, um, and we hit into some roadblocks because data is not available. So then we started looking into uh, where the problems are. So as we all know, it's all data silos. Um, very, um, data is siloed in function systems everywhere. Then we said, like, okay, let's do, uh, let's prioritize, similar to what uh, what we heard so far. So then uh, we worked with BCG. That's when I uh, met with Luca uh, to see um, where the where the maturity of our organization R and D is. So some are some functions are very mature because you were you are working with regulation regulatory agencies. So no matter what, you have to meet. Uh, the regulatory standards on your data collection, data standardization, data submissions. But in some functions, data is not, like you can be free for all, you have to be innovative, like for example, research functions. You, you, you work on your experiment, you, you compile your data in an Excel spreadsheet, you move on to next, la next experiment. But if you go to clinical trial studies, that th those are, uh, you, you, you have to be very controlled because you, need, you have an obligation to submit a high quality data to regulatory authorities. So that's when um, the, the uh, uh, maturity assessment kind of helped us, which functions are more mature, which functions are not. And then we interviewed the stakeholders, what are more value impact uh, use cases are. So that's how we prioritized. Uh, identified initiatives too. So when, um, and also form this R&D data office organization, a centralized organization which can uh, build these uh, data governance across the board and bridge these silos together. Um, so when you have these kind of organizations, the expectation is uh, in a year, you will solve all the problems, right? You will create the best of the balls, um, which is not possible. You don't have like a millions of dollars or uh, right resources in the groups. So that's when this prioritization kind of helped. Which ones will bring you more value? Uh, what can you deliver in three, six, nine months? Like master data management, it's a multi-year initiative. You cannot solve every, everything in one, one go. So what are the key components of master data that you want to hand, uh, man, uh, implement? Or what are the cataloging? Which catalogs you should tackle first so that you will get more value? And uh, another thing is data sharing. Um, you, you are conducting these clinical trials, like millions of dollars you are spending, either a success or a failure, you are shoveling the data into a closet and you are moving on to another clinical trial. But now industry is realizing that and re trying to bring in the, all these historical data into more use cases to, in the drug discovery and um, um, development uh, uh, initiatives. But it takes a lot of time to pool this data and use it for re, um, actual um, use cases. So that's where we identified these prioritization use cases and tackled the capabilities use case by use case um, so that we can bring in the value. Um, so I think the prioritization, prioritization, prioritization is the big thing. 
and also uh, another another uh, big uh, big big support we need is top down support i think luca mentioned about it uh, you you need a, that vision from leadership level and a support um, throughout the continuum it's not like you invest like a multi million dollar in 2 years you are done right no it it won't happen you are getting new modalities new science is evolving regulations are evolving so it's going to be a continuous journey so i think that that support and understanding at the top down is very very important i'll, I'll stop here and maybe add on more later so we we are we should have a, a, a fourth uh, panelist he is not is not there unfortunately so you can be the fourth uh, panelist if someone wants to share this experience something which is perhaps different of what i have presented please do yeah So could you uh, please tell us how did you choose your first use cases and, and uh, what uh, was this use cases, examples of them? As I mentioned, the, the use cases are more coming from the business, the pain points, the challenges. Okay, I'm, um, it is taking four months to find out uh, how many clinical trials are there in respiratory therapeutic area, just as, as an example. Um, it may take maybe talking to call a friend or talking to a few people in the company and try to find out. Instead, um, can we uh, can we create an, a data catalog where you can see um, all the clinical trials that we have done so far in the company with more business contextual view? We may we may have we may be able to find the data with going in multiple hoops, but can we find it in a much faster way? I think by talking to people, by understanding the business um, b business value, I think based on interviews, we, we identified our uh, use cases. Um, and also stories, right, user stories. Um, how many manual steps are you taking to get your outcome? So any of the data management or data governance success is the speed, how fast you can get to your data and able to make the decision, right? So that's how um, more surveys and interviews uh, we conducted. And then uh, understanding the business process it also helped. Yeah, maybe. so maybe I'll do a quick poll for the current, like, um, in-person audience here. How many of you are actually from pharmaceutical, biotech, healthcare sector? OK. That's great. So about like 50%. Um, so in, in Jensen, I can share some of the you know ex experience from Jensen R and D perspective. You know, when we're looking at research and development, we started um, you know high priority use cases are in the development space because if you think about how do we using data science to enable drug uh, discovery and development, um, we're looking for increase of productivity. So this is actually the key. Right. You want to focus on productivity, not on the efficiency. The reason for that is actually, you know, how we realizing the data to the value of the business, right? And so we started in the development, how do we using data, how do we using data science to accelerate trial enrollment, to find the patients, to making sure, you know, using real world data to um, leveraging that capabilities to looking into uh, how do we design our trial better, right? How do we find alternative clinical trial endpoints? How do we make our trial more successful, shorten the trial uh, enrollment period? A lot of these type of use cases, you can see an immediate impact on the program, on the portfolio. This is super, super important. You need to demonstrate the high impact use cases first to go in and then get buy-ins from the, not just the, senior management, but also the people who's on the ground, generating the data for you, using the data, doing the models, they see the impact, they got excited, and everyone is actually want to do more about this type of work, right? So this is super important, yeah. yeah. So for, for all the others that are not in healthcare, and even for the, guy, the, the, the person in healthcare, uh, basically the, the way to choose the, um, the um, the, uh, the use cases of business outcome. Uh, basically, I would say you, you, you can make three lists. The first list is you take, you, 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 you try to, uh, to list all the pain points you have coming from 
uh, projects you did in the past. No problems you have with your data, access to the data, quality of the data, um, inconsist inconsistency you have in, in, in your report and, and things like that. The second list is the list of all the next projects you want to do, over the classical one. Everybody in your, in your industry are, are, are doing and things like that. And the third list is what is your, so basically the first two gives you the, the right to play. Right? You, 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 give, you, you are in a game and you, you have the right to continue to play with your competitors. And then you have a third list which is, what's my right to win? What are the, 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 the key use cases that perhaps I will be the first one or the only one or the fastest one to, to do? You have this first. And then you prioritize them according to the impact you, you expect uh, from, from them. You, know, so you, you start to have some excitement in the board. Right? But then uh, it's not sufficient. Because most probably, the higher is the impact, the more difficult it is, right? And most probably, you don't have the capability. So you have to adjust that ranking, I would say, by the feasibility. Because delivering the first use cases is good, uh, but uh, delivering the capabilities that you need to support all, the, all, all, all your agenda is even more important. So you start to use this kind of approach to translate your tree list into the data you need, and the technology, the architecture you need, right? And it means that you have two maps, a map of data you need and a map of uh, your architecture blueprint, to make it simple, right? And basically, you take this map as a map of the demand and map of, of the supply, meaning the demand is that what do you need to support the use cases and the map of the supply is where are you today? What is the, uh, the availability, accessibility, quality of the data? What is the state of your architecture today? Where do you want to be? So you have the gap. And then looking at this, it gives you, you have two heat maps, and the heat map tells you how to prioritize these use cases, right? And it tells you as well where you have to accelerate on the data side, on the technology side to make it happen. And what, I, what I'm saying that you break down the complexity, this is the way to break down the complexity. You have concrete targets that, and, and, and you can create a roadmap on how to achieve as fast as possible these targets while creating capabilities as soon as possible as you need it for, for your use cases. There's a question from virtual audience. How can you measure the value of data democratization? Is there a framework or methodology to measure the value? So first of all, first you want to explain what you are doing <laughs> and then I can, <laughs> see, I can see what I'm seeing okay. at my clients. Go ahead, Raj. Um, it depends on the maturity of the organization. When you are building the group first time, um, you don't have any baseline. So surveys, um, maturity assessments kind of help us to create the baseline. Then the value, based on the capabilities you are building, um, you, you start how you want to uh, measure the qualitative and quantitative, and uh, quantitatively the value of the initiative. Like for example, if you're taking cataloging, uh, how many data assets you have in the organization, right? So once you create the baseline, how many you are able to catalog? The percentage of uh, assets you cataloged over a period of time is something you will, be, will, be, will become a metric. And then you can show that, OK, this percentage, I'm able to deliver it as a value to the organization. And also, you are able to bring that um, uh, catalog kind of uh, to the data scientists much faster. So the data scientists are able to use the data much faster than they used to be before. Right? You, can, you can gauge how fast they were able to access the data. It maybe was taking 10 days, now today it is taking three days. And another, another example I'll give you is data governance. Um, when, you, when you want to, when data democratization is two things, right? One is uh, everything is automated, click off a button, you, ac you request an access, you will get the access, get go, the data, yeah, you can do the analysis and you tell the story. Second thing, certain data sets, you, cannot, uh, you need to go through some kind of a uh, governance process because you, you, you may not be able to access to it without giving a justification because that data set has some kind of legal or uh, ethical concerns. You collected the data for one purpose, maybe you can use it only for that purpose. But after you justify, after you give some justification, you can use that data to beyond after you de-identify the data or anonymize the data. So that the whole process, if you can streamline it 
and you can give access to the data scientist in less period of time. That is the value you are bringing to the organization. Um, and, and then another way is on the data, data sciences side. Um, if you are able to recruit a patient much faster than in your traditional way, that is another metric that you can show the value that, okay, in, uh, we are able to recruit a patient or close a study much faster than um, a, a, a year ago. So I think the value is based on the initiative we are going to drive. And I think when you are, in, when you are um, launching that initiative, you should have a clear idea on how you want to measure it and how you want to show the value year over year, over year to the organization. And maybe Shawin can. Yeah, I can speak a little bit more about that as well. So um, number one, never a data project, right? So that's uh, one key thing we want to remember when we doing this type of work. Because I see a lot of time people just, oh, let's bring all the data into a data lake or data house and, uh, and we spend millions, millions of dollars on that, number, numerous resources on that. And at the end of the day, at the end of the day, when once the data was in the data lake, oh, let's think about the use case. And uh, you know, what we can do with this data, we have this awesome data warehouse and uh, you know, we can enable this use case or that use case. And that is too late, right? So most important thing, you need to have a very clear business outcome begin at the beginning of the journey. And that's super important. And the value, once it's aligned with business outcome, business strategy, and it's actually very easy to measure because you're measuring the business outcome through your project, right? You know, just kind of a going back to the previous you know, use case, we we're just talking about like patient recruitment. If we can shorten the recruitment for three months, and which potentially means we can bring the drug to our patients three, three months ahead of time, what's the impact to our patients, right? To our community? It's very easy to measure, right? And of course, you always, as I mentioned before, you want to focus on productivity, less about the efficiency, because productivity is the key. And um, you know, those are the kind of lessons learned we see all these years. You know, good project, failed project, so something okay project. But uh, you know, one of the key things once you align with the business strategy is actually very easy to leading those projects and. Uh, and the other thing I want to emphasize is when you doing the implementation, you, you want to focus in on your core capabilities. And those core capabilities, to so start with, you need to think about how to reuse, reuse them down the, down the road as well. So it's a Lego set, right? It's not just like for this particular use case. You can actually use all the components in the future for enable other use cases and always have the you know, think about the scalability at the beginning as well. So don't do one-off project, yeah. That, that last part is very important because when we speak about business outcome, use case, and things like that, quite a lot of companies are stuck by the fact that they focus on the first two use cases, then they look at what they have to do in order to enable them and say oh, there is no business case, right? Because I, I cannot put an MDM in place just to achieve that. There is no, there is no business case. There's a reason why you know, making that exercise as having what I have to build to achieve that journey and sequencing these capabilities, I will invest now to achieve that. I can do a piece now to enable this, but I already do something because I will accelerate the other one. It's what gives you the, 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 the global vision, the reason why you are doing it. While, so you can invest now for something later, but it's important that your first use cases are delivering value very fast because your board will not expect too much and you will not just believe because you said it on a PowerPoint that it will, it will happen. No, you have to demonstrate some value every quarter. Uh, this is very important. So because at the end of the day, what is the value of dem data de democratization is the value of these business outcomes and the value because you do these things faster and uh, for, for, less, for less budget. There is no, you know, in, there is no value for data democratization for just for data 
democratization. You, you, you access the data to generate something. The value is there. Any, from Bali? Anyone wants to share their experiences on how they are measuring the data value? <laughs> Thank you. I want to I want to circle back to the use cases. I think there is a lot of opinions on what constitutes a use case. And at the very beginning, um, Luca, you spoke of macro use cases, and um, the the panelists have also given some examples of what those use cases are. But um, I'm looking for you know. In the drug discovery area specifically, let's say, are we saying we want to um, have X amount of drugs in the pipeline, or is it that we want to have um, uh, drugs with a higher probability of success go through the pipeline? Is is that the level, the business level that you're at, or are you at more of a quasi business technology I, um, mixture? I, I love I love the question. Thank you, thank, thank you very much. I, I, I receive it every every month, most most probably. Uh, <clears throat> so your your use case, it depends who you have to convince that is the good reason to. To, to, to build these capabilities. Now, when you speak with, with the board, you, have something, you, you need something rather high-level, aspirational, things that they understand, something that will disrupt the industry or something that will be better than the, uh, than the competitors or a well-known pain point you have in the company that you will remove. Now, when you will speak with people below the board and people that knows all the details and things like that, you have to be more precise, right? Exactly what what concretely I will deliver in that context of that big, that big, big uh, use case and things like that. And at the end of the day, the, the main, I would say, uh, value of having a chief data officer or a data office or something like that is his ability to take all this story, to make a plan out of it, and to, tell the, and to orchestrate for the company the delivery. He, he, he or she will not deliver everything. He will orchestrate. The fact that, yes, it will, it will put everything in the context of what the board has to know. And at, a, at another other level of granularity, it will explain what has to be done. But at the end of the day, you're right. It should not be macro only. The macro is there to give the, the, the direction. And then you have to be as concrete as possible. Because at the end of the day, you have to deliver something in your infrastructure with concrete uh, data to concrete workers on the, on the ground. So it cannot stay at the level of, uh, of a big story. But you need that story to give the direction to be able to work like you know Russian dolls. Uh, you have everything should be coherent uh, because you need the vision, the drive, and the conviction, and uh, basically to give the means from the board. And you need uh, at every level of the company, you need people convinced to put the capacity and to to make the right change to make it happen. So this is uh, I think a little bit of a hypothetical question. Uh, your two are from Big Pharma or know a lot about Big Pharma. Do you set boundaries or do you maintain boundaries between what I would call scientific and technical data, the, which probably have terabytes of information, your gene sequencing, your molecular analysis data, uh, you know, in your high or HPC or your grid? Or is it an integration between the principles you've discussed and the scientific and technical data? My analogy, so I'm not from pharma. I'm from uh, finance, and the economists sometimes live in their own zone, which is unconnected to everything we're talking about in data governance. Um, so maybe I'll, I'll step back a little bit um, on that question, but um, you know, number one, when we're talking about democratized data, it's actually less about the data itself, it's more about the insights and also the culture change within the organization. So that's actually number one thing I will emphasize. And in terms of the data perspective, um, it still need to go back to the kind of a business strategy and align with business strategy. But you know, here's the thing, right? We need to lay out all the key use cases or business strategy on the, um, on the left side, and you lay out what are the data you need to answer those questions, right? And it doesn't matter where they're stored, but those data is needed and prioritized and ingested, cataloged, and curated into your data ecosystem to enable those use cases. 
So I don't know if uh, that answers your question. Yeah. You know your world, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> Luca, maybe maybe j just to add to it, we are um, collecting tons of data, right? Wearables data, like every second, every minute you are collecting. Like, wh what do you want to do with that data, right? What type of insights you want to drive? Um, I think that is important, that business question. Um, like, you have these genomics data. You want to combine that with clinical trial data and try to find out new drugs, new, new, um, and also assess the probability of success. What, what is this molecule's probability of success is? I think based on that business question, I think you can integrate this data. We are collecting all this data, but we don't have, it, at least I can speak, don't have full capability to uh, store, ingest, uh, catalog, do the full life cycle of the data and connect with other data, si data to make better insights. So that's why we are still handling use case by use case to see, okay, for this use case, maybe I need to combine these two data sets, so let me work on that. Um, at least at Sanofi, that's how we are prioritizing the data sets, because the science is going so fast, new modalities are growing so fast, so you need that prioritization. Uh, and I, I think that that's how we are handling. Um, yeah. So globally, whatever, healthcare or finance or things like that, you have the wishes and then you have the constraints. Um, if you have no constraints of the technology, if you have the, co the technology to, to, to attract, to, to source, and to, and, and, and to store the data, uh, you do it. Then you, you, you keep them. Most probably there will be a usage at some point of time. Then in the finance industry, you cannot keep certain type of data more than 10 years, more than five years, and things like that. You start to have some constraints at some point of time. You have to erase these... Uh, these, uh, these, uh, these data. Uh, sometimes you don't have the technology yet to, to do it. For example, you know, uh, you have seen in one of my first slides uh, the reason why the industrial or automotive are a bit lower in the data maturity is because they, they, they didn't have a lot of access to data before. You know, the data, the data access is due to IoT, mainly for these industries. But they need to put in place these, um, these technologies to start to acquire the data. So the moment they have it, they, 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 they have everything. You know? Tes Tesla is gathering all the data because basically it's a computer on four wheels. Right? But for the classical automotive companies, it was different. They had to, uh, to be able to put that technology to, to gather the data. So I would say, first of all, all the wishes. If you, if you have data, you can store them. No problem of budget for, or of storage. You know, with days less and less constraint uh, because that. If you have no um, uh, regulations con con constraint, keep, 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 keep the data. Uh, but then you have some constraints, technology and things like that. And, and then you prioritize. If you know already what you want to do and you know the, the value it will deliver, you prioritize that. If you don't have the constraints, of course, take them. I'm, I'm wondering what, what process do you follow to gather those wishes, and are the users of the data involved in, in gathering the, the use cases before you, you prioritize them? Maybe I'll start. <laughs> yeah. So um, number one is, uh, is actually you have to work with um, you know, therapeutic areas like very in pharmaceutical, right? So basically working with the data generators and also data consumers together side by side to define the use case, define the strategy, and to define what data is actually need to be prioritized, what use case need to be prioritized. I think that's the first thing you want to do. And second is you need to know your, you, um, your user community, right? And you need to know like what are the um, basically, um, what type of user you're going to engage in terms of data con con consumption, like who is going to use it for what purpose, right? Um, and that's important because not everyone is as savvy as a data scientist, right? So you, you need to kind of uh, differentiate um, who is going to have access directly to the data so they can run analysis, run models, who will be kind of con consumer of the um, 
insights generating from the data, who's going to be re receiving more actionable insights from the data to make decisions, right? And each of the um, user groups will have different needs, and also you have to prioritize their needs as well, right? So that's the second piece. And the last piece, I think, during the whole process, which is very important, you have to be very adaptive um, in terms of thinking about what needs to be delivered um, in terms of the data, in terms of insight, in terms of tools, in terms of platform. But everything all together has to be also adaptive. It can be changed the direction as needed. Um, because, you know, as Raj just mentioned, there's a lot of moving parts in the, in the, in the process, right? And you want to get to the finish line first for some of the users, and you want to make sure you also engage all the other user group during the process as well. Yeah. So I'm in the retail sector, and I built uh, a data lake for my application users and completely neglected my business users mm. on, the, on the initial onset. And now I'm going back and having to figure out how do I get them access? Because they can't do, they can't even spell ETL, let alone do it. So now I'm having to figure out how do I give them access to a very large data set so they can do analytic, well, reporting really. So yeah, it's definitely a, a, a problem because then you've got all these different users that have all these different skills and they have different problems. And uh, one of the dangerous things that you don't want to build a system for just one person. <laughs> <laughs> because when you engage with the user group, some people are more vocal, right? They drive a lot of uh, user experience in those conversations. So that's why from the implementation perspective, you need to have someone who has a very strong domain knowledge, understanding the user, understanding the data, understanding the business yeah. to be able to make the right decision. Yeah. I think we need some multilingual skills to to do that. And one thing I want to add to what uh, Shai Ying said, you, you need some user-specific uh, workshops to identify how they are doing it today and what, does, what do we need to do differently, uh, right? So I think sometimes you don't know what you don't know. So that's where I think uh, some of these um, workshops kind of help, uh, help us to understand what business is doing on day to day and what is the manual uh, manual steps they are pro they are following, or what are the pain points? So I think that connection, that bilingual, that technology and business and scientific, everything has to come together. I think those uh, some hand holding is needed. I think that is done through I think some kind of workshops. So I I, I just want to add on top of what Shaying said. Mm -hmm. Hey, so I, I guess I, I'm I'm interested in hearing a little more about. In, in the, the use cases that you're describing, who your customer is. And the reason I ask is kind of in the paradigm that we put up in our environment, we have enterprise information management, which is bringing in, ingesting all the data, doing all the ETL, creating data lakes, all, all the different repositories mm -hmm. and stuff. And their customer is analytics teams or power users. Whereas the analytics teams and power users, and some who also report to me, um, their stakeholders are those people that want dashboards and reports, either executives or some of their staff. And uh, I think that context would be helpful in this because um, some of it might feel like, okay, are, are we providing the right service to the right group? Yeah, yeah I think that that's a very good question and that's actually the challenge we're facing every day as well. The persona is actually pretty diverse. Um, in my case, um, our team actually um, kind of a partner with data scientists within our own organization and also bench scientists, clinicians, executives as well. So when we're building things, we be looking into our first priority when we build my AI, um, we started with data science workbench. Because you have to enable your army, which is our data scientist, to be able to uh, deliver those use cases, doing analysis, crunching the numbers first, right? So that's actually our first components enabled in our ecosystem. And the second, in parallel, we're actually building our catalog. 
because that enable not just data scientists, but also the entire community to see where the data is, how we can get access, those kind of things are more transparent. Once you bring the transparency to the entire organization, it actually generating a lot of uh, interest using data, you're changing the data culture as well. So you're moving your organization to a more data-centric organization. And even for the people who are generating the data, they can see how the data being used downstream, which is very important because our data scientists are actually kind of at the last mile when the data was actually pumping through the pipeline. And the people who are generating the data don't see the value. Like, why you ask me to do all these things, right? And then they can realize, oh, this can be used. Oh, I can use it then they will be more on board in terms of curating the data, in terms of integrating data, in terms of providing more metadata associated with the data they generated as well. So that's actually super important. And then if we think about you know, our own experience, um, data scientists, and then the people actually doing the work, like bench scientists, clinicians, or the trial manager, trial you know, kind of a program manager, those are the people are the second uh, personas we enabled. And those are people who can use a little bit like click and uh, you know uh, drag and drop, um, but everything if you kind of um, give them a template, they can you use some of the insights from the data prepared by the data scientist, right? And then at the same time, you want to making sure you bring the KPIs to the senior executives so they understand how the program is actually doing, right? So those are the three personas you want to focus on. And but at the beginning, you, you want to prioritize your data scientist team. Um, but that's just a, you know, very specific for the data science organization, yeah. We have a question in the back here. Yeah, kind of a comment. I was trying to remain quiet, but the, the question, I mean, on, on use cases, that's like the linchpin to succeed on delivering these kinds of solutions. and. And it's extremely important to do the collection of use cases in a very structured way, but it isn't a one-way journey. Because if uh, people love to give you a wish list of all the stuff they'd like to have, it's an excellent opportunity to actually capture what's the benefit and will you commit to use it if it's delivered and drive the value back to the organization. Because the data organization can never capture the value. It's always, the value is captured in the business, whether the business is R&D or commercial or wherever. Um, and also think in hundreds of use cases, not five or ten. Mm -hmm. Certainly, like Luca mentioned, we've seen a lot of people paint themselves in the corner because they will build a solution based on a single use case, like real-world data. And they'll build a whole solution, and then that solution is a one-hit wonder, and they can never get to anything else. So it's ex massively important to build a portfolio of use cases when you start to build the ecosystem so you're supporting a lot of this diversity, it's back to what Raj was mentioning around trying to break it into three to six month chunks. Certainly like increasing probability of success in preclinical, that's at the board level, that's a metric they wanna see, that's not a use case. That's a vision, that's a strategy. There's probably 50 things that lead up to increasing probability of success. Um, you know, One of the clients we've worked with, that broke into a lot of different pieces, it could be changing the way that safety signals are identified and using data to drive that versus the traditional way. It could be running biological similarities on every compound to see how things, there's, a, there's gonna be a number of things and you have to get the buy-in of the folks that are actually going to use it. And, uh, and like Jia Ying was mentioning around the personas of the people who will be pushing the buttons, but you've gotta get to the folks who actually are using that to make a decision and they have to change the way they're going to make decisions or none of this is ever relevant. So it, 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 in, especially like in drug discovery, it's gotta be the folks who are making the decision on which products or potential products move forward in the pipeline and they need to change the way they're gonna do that. Because if they keep doing it the way they've always done it, then nothing will change and there's no value in, in investing in the technology. And so I think we've typically seen folks have too, many, have too few use cases instead of too many. Um, so again, think hundreds. Now you have to prioritize, you can't work on 100. You can work on 10 or 12 or 15 or whatever, but you've gotta work on a portfolio, and, but you have to have a, a whole collection. And I like the pyramid, other than I think it's bi-directional. I think you've, every company in here has a bunch of data that you start with. You're not 
a fresh company. So you can't set a vision and work your way from top down, which I know is not the intent. But you've got to start at the bottom and try to get an inventory and understand what the heck you have. And you've got to start at the top and say, how are we going to use this differently to really change the way we make decisions? Absolutely. Hi, Luca. It's, it's Thanks. We can discuss right Hi, Luca. Just a quick question. So, uh, do you have any specific data on the life sciences data maturity, or is it healthcare and it's specific? Uh, no, we have it for all the industries. I okay. used healthcare because it was in the context of the panel that people I have here, and also because, just as a hazard, healthcare is. Uh, more or less the average in the I industry. So it was easy to present the, uh, the figures, but uh, I have them for all the industries and for some sectors behind the industry. OK, okay thank you. And uh, where do you see Sanofi uh, in the data maturity? What does the next plans look like uh, in terms of data maturity? And what is the uh, gaps that you'd like to address? As I said, uh, the organization is at the different functions are at different levels, right? Like regulatory, clinical, they are very mature because we are very, they are very close to regulate um, um, submissions. But if you look at research and uh, other functions, they are very innovative. So you need that innovation. So you you build an experiment, you conduct that, you collect the data, you move on. So in those areas, the maturity is little low. So that's where we are building uh, data foundations. Uh, we are uh, building that the whole capability of cataloging, data cartography, and um, the whole analytics piece on top of it. So uh, and another big thing we are working on is um, data continuum. So how you connect the data between diverse data sets. Um, I think that's one, one of the big thing. I think it's an in, in industry level challenge, right? It's not just Sanofi or just uh, Janssen. Um, we are trying to identify these. That's why I think maybe most of the conversation we are having on use cases. What use cases, what business outcomes you want to drive, which data sets you want to combine. I think the power of the data comes when you are able to con combine multiple data sets together. So I think that that's where uh, most of our energy is spent right now. I would like to link to Stephanie. I would like to thank the panel, and you can continue the conversation after. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, so thank much. you for attending mm -hmm. the session. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.